Biblical, Biblical Inaccuracy and John 3:16 Part 2 An analysis of the famous biblical verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Part 3 of 5 Description, More Reasons to Doubt the Reliability of the Bible The following is a summary of what we have covered to date in this series of articles. 1. Episode 1, The Gospel Known as a John, Almost Certainly Was Not Written by the Disciple John. 2. Episode 2, Bible Translators Illegitimately Capitalized a Him in John 3. 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life, to make Jesus look like God. 3. Also in Episode 2, the Bible does not stand up to the basic requirements of reliability, and hence does not satisfy the standards of sacred scripture. The last item in this list, number 3, is critical. In order to give credence to the claims of John 3 verse 16, the Bible itself has to stand up to critical analysis. It is that analysis that I continue here. The previous article was more scholastic, what follows is more common sense. Let's start with the obvious. If the Bible is the Word of God, then what should we make of verses that tell us they are not the Word of God? Paradoxically, this is precisely what we find in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 12, but to the rest I, not the Lord, say. Indicating that what follows was from the author, in this case, Paul, and not from God. So if nothing else, this section of the Bible, by Paul's own admission, is not the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 16 points out that Paul could not remember if he baptized anybody other than Crispus if Gaius, and the household of Stephanas. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Now, does this sound like God talking? Would God say, Paul baptized Crispus, Gaius, and the household of Stephanas, and there may have been others. But that was a long time ago, and, well, you know, so much has happened since then. It's all kind of fuzzy to me right now? 1 Corinthians 7 verses 25 and 26 records Paul as having written, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose therefore that this is good because of the present distress. Italics mine. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 17 reads, What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were, foolishly. Again, does anybody believe that God talks like this? Paul admitted that he answered without guidance from God and without divine authority. And that he personally believed himself to be divinely trustworthy in one case, but speaking foolishly in the other. Paul justified his presumption of authority with the words, according to my judgment, and I think I also have the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 40 The problem is that a whole lot of people have claimed that the Spirit of God, while all the time doing some very strange and ungodly things. So should Paul's confidence be admired or condemned? However we answer this question, the point is that whereas human confidence wavers at times, such is not the case with the all-knowing, all-powerful Creator. God would never say, I suppose. As Paul does. In essence, the Bible is its own worst critic. If we view the Bible as revelation, including telling the story of Jesus Christ, then we have to wonder why it is so inconsistent. For example, when celebrities die, their final words are frequently immortalized. And yet, the Bible gives us two different accounts of Jesus' last words, Luke 23 verse 46 states. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. But John 19 verse 30 says something completely different. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This is a bold and undeniable contradiction. Jesus' most famous and respected teaching is probably the Lord's Prayer, which Matthew 6 verses 9 and 13 records as, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, this day, our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But Luke 11 colon 2, 5 records the same prayer with some very crucial differences, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, day by day, our daily bread. 
and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus Christ's most famous prayer, and the two gospel writings that tell the tale disagree. The discrepancy is so great that the Jesus Seminar, a body of prominent biblical scholars, announced the only word of the Lord's Prayer that can be directly attributed to Jesus is Our Father, Newsweek. October 31, 1988. Page 80. This conclusion is startling, for it not only shakes one of the most accepted trees in the forest of Christian faith, but it questions that very tree's legitimacy. Regarding the law, Rabbi Jesus taught Old Testament law. Furthermore, he taught the law would endure, till heaven and earth pass away, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away. One jot, a Greek iota, the ninth letter of the Greek alphabet, or one tittle, a stroke or dot, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled, Matthew 5 verses 17 and 18. Add to that, but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments, Matthew 19 verse 17. So that is what Jesus taught. Now, what did Paul teach? Answer, justification by faith, the vain concept that belief in Jesus Christ cancels a person's sins. Paul didn't change just a jot or a tittle. No, he cancelled the entire law, and by him, Jesus Christ, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses, Acts 13 verse 39. A more permissive blanket statement would be hard to conceive. We can easily imagine the voice of the collective public screaming, please, let's have more of that. And here it is. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died, i.e., suffered, to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter, Romans 7 verse 6. Or, if I may freely paraphrase. But now I tell you to forget this old law, the inconveniences of which we have lived with for too long, and live by the religion of our desires, rather than by the old. Uncomfortable mandates of revelation. According to Paul, God's law was good enough for Moses and Jesus, but not for the rest of humankind. Punch the skip button. Nowhere in the Bible did Jesus teach the Trinity. In fact, he taught Tawhid, divine unity. Read Mark 12 verse 30, Matthew 22 verse 37, and Luke 10 verse 27. The first of all the commandments is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But presto, changeo, Pauline theologians adopted the Trinity. So Jesus' most important teachings, his last words, his prayer, the oneness of God, and our Creator's law for mankind, are all cancelled elsewhere in the Bible by Paul. Or by Pauline theologians who followed in his wake. Which of Jesus' teachings, precisely, are not contradicted in the Bible? Unreliability is such a common problem, the unindoctrinated audience doesn't know what to believe. 2 Samuel 24 One reads, Again the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. However, 1 Chronicles 21. One states, Now Satan stood up against Israel, and moved David to number Israel. Well, which was it? The Lord, or Satan? Both verses describe the same event in history, but one speaks of God and the other of Satan. There is a slight, like, total, difference. If a book of a scripture can't differentiate between God and Satan, the only thing we know for sure is that it's not pure, unadulterated revelation.
There are so many contradictions in the New Testament that authors have devoted books to this subject. For example, Matthew 2 verse 14 and Luke 2 verse 39 differ over whether Jesus' family fled to Egypt or to Nazareth, in Palestine. Matthew 6 verses 9 to 13 and Luke 11 verses 2 to 4 differ over the wording of the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 11 verses 13 to 14, 17 colon 11 dash 13 and John 1 verse 21 disagree over whether John the Baptist was Elijah. Things get worse when we enter the arena of the alleged crucifixion, who carried the cross, Simon, Luke 23 verse 26, Matthew 27 verse 32, Mark 15 verse 21, or Jesus, John 19 verse 17. Was Jesus dressed in a scarlet robe, Matthew 27 verse 28, or a purple robe, John 19 verse 2? Did the Roman soldiers put gall, Matthew 27 verse 34, or myrrh, Mark 15 verse 23, in his wine? Was Jesus crucified before the third hour, Mark 15 verse 25, or after the sixth hour? John 19 verses 14 to 15? Did Jesus ascend the first day, Luke 23 verse 43, or not, John 20 verse 17? These are only a few of a long list of scriptural inconsistencies, but they underscore the difficulty in trusting the New Testament as scripture. And if we can't trust the Bible as a whole, how can we trust any particular part of it, like, say, John 3 verse 16, upon which Christians base their salvation. Part 4 of 5. Description, a discussion on the Christian concepts of sacrifice, atonement and redemption by faith. The linchpin of John 3 verse 16 and, for that matter, of the entire Christian concept of redemption by faith, is the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. John 3 verse 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. On the other hand, a huge number of religious scholars tell us this isn't true. So who should we believe, the Bible, or them? To begin with, we know who the scholars are, whereas we have no idea who authored any of the Gospels, as discussed in part 1 of this series. Secondly, the Bible translators illegitimately capitalized him in John 3 verse 16 to make Jesus look like God, as discussed in part 2 of this series. If you're paying attention, you noticed I did the same thing above, capitalizing religious scholars, them, and the scholars. It makes these scholars look special, doesn't it? But that's just one way in which Bible translators deceive their audience. I admit, I did it as a ploy, they don't. Lastly, what I have presented so far conforms both to reason and to common sense, unlike the Bible, which is internally inconsistent and factually unreliable, parts 2 and 3 of this series. In this episode 1 address the concepts of sacrifice and atonement, and the effortless salvation people seek through the Christian concept of redemption by faith. The foundation of this concept rests upon the validity of original sin, the church's doctrine that children are born with the guilt of Adam's first sin, which we know is false. 
because Jesus taught the exact opposite. Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 19 verse 14. Now, how can of such be the kingdom of children are either born? Now, how can of such be the kingdom of heaven if the unbaptized are hellbound? Children are either born with original sin or are bound for the kingdom of heaven. The church can't have it both ways. Ezekiel 18 verse 20 records, The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself, and Deuteronomy 24 verse 16 repeats the point. This is Old Testament, but it's not older than Adam. If original sin dated from the beginning with Adam and Eve, we wouldn't find the concept disavowed in any scripture of any later age. Moving on to the concept of belief in Jesus' self-sacrifice as being sufficient for salvation, Jesus reportedly refutes this claim as follows. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, Matthew 7. 21, and, but if you want to enter into life, eternal life, that is, i.e., salvation, keep the commandments, Matthew 19 verse 17. James was at odds with Paul over this doctrine, and reportedly taught the importance of righteous works. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also, James 2. 26. But where in the New Testament did Jesus counsel his followers that they could relax? For in a few days he would pay the price and they could all go to heaven on nothing more than belief? Nowhere. For that matter, when Jesus was allegedly resurrected why didn't he declare the atonement? Why didn't he announce that he had paid for the sins of the world, past, present and future? But he didn't, and we should wonder why. Could it be the atonement isn't true? Could it be that someone scribbled wishful thoughts into the margins of scripture? It wouldn't be the first time. So where did the atonement come from in the first place? And would anyone be surprised to hear the name, Paul? Another questionable doctrine coming from the same questionable source? So it would seem. Acts 17 verse 18 reads, Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, Paul. And some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Paul directly claims to have conceived the doctrine of resurrection as follows, Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, 2 Timothy 2 verse 8. Sure enough, the concept of Jesus Christ dying for the sins of humankind is found in the epistles of Paul, example, Romans 5 verses 8 and 11 and 6 colon 8, 9, and nowhere else. Nowhere else? Not from Jesus? Not from the disciples? Is it possible that they neglected the critical details upon which Christian faith rests? Not likely. So in one corner we have the true prophets, Jesus Christ included, teaching salvation through adhering to God's laws as conveyed through revelation, that is, salvation through faith and works. In the other corner we have the challenger, Paul, promising an effortless salvation following a life unrestricted by commandments, in other words, salvation through faith alone. What can we imagine Jesus will say, upon his return, when he finds a group of his followers, preferring Pauline theology to his own teachings? Perhaps Jesus will quote Jeremiah 23 verse 32, Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell them, and cause my people to, um, by their lies, and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them, therefore they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. When Jesus does return, one thing we can be sure he is not going to do is congratulate his followers, for throwing away everything he taught and doing the exact opposite, on the authority of Paul. In the next episode, we will question why Christians believe John 3 verse 16 in the face of so much evidence against it.